If you're new to running projects, you're going to need some management skills. I found that most new foremen have only one management tool in their toolbox. The words hurry up. It's a lot of responsibility to be in a position where you have to manage manpower profitably, especially when your future depends on your success. This creates a lot of stress and a real sense of urgency. Unless and until there's a good management system in place, most young foremen just push, push, push. This type of management creates a lot of unnecessary stress and turmoil. Your management system needs to be consistent so that everyone knows exactly what to expect. Easy to implement, otherwise it won't get used. Fair, so the employees will embrace it. So here it is in its basic form. You need to give employees clear instruction and you need to make sure they understand them. Like the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't give clear detailed instructions and make sure they are understood, you will not get good results. It's that simple. If you're dealing with employees that you've not worked with before, you need to check their progress frequently. This gives you the opportunity to reinforce the skills and habits that you're looking for and eliminate the ones you don't want. You do this by giving frequent positive feedback when they succeed in completing tasks properly and by giving positive feedback when they do not complete tasks properly. In other words, by letting them know what you like and what you don't like. This gives them the opportunity to learn how you like work to be performed and to get used to working that way. Once workers are familiar with your preferences, get out of their way and let them do their job. From there on, check on them less frequently, but monitor their progress and make sure they stay on track. If they begin to slide off track, Give them immediate reinforcement to get them back on track. If the situation is serious enough to warrant it, go back to step two until they're back on solid ground. Everybody knows you're the big boss, so get over it. These people on your crew are not your servants. In fact, you are their servant. That's right, you heard me correctly. You are their servant. After about 10 years of running projects, one day I had a revelation. I discovered a secret that completely changed my method of managing my projects. It was so powerful that as soon as I understood it, my success improved immensely. After that, I completely changed my method of managing projects, and it launched my career. I'm going to share that secret with you now, and here it is. Electrical work involves installing electrical material. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Well, stick with me a minute. Let's see if I can change your mind about that. Let's imagine that you're starting a new big project. Maybe you send a couple of conixes out there to store tools and material. Then you send out a forklift to unload material, a couple scissor lifts to install the material a game box full of tools, and some material to fill the Connex. Now, at this point, you could probably build that project for the material in the Connex and some mobilization fees. But from there on, if no material gets installed, your company probably isn't going to see any more money. From that point on, your company gets paid each month for the amount of material they get installed plus the cost of any new major material that shows up on site. But if material shows up and doesn't get installed, those checks are going to dry up real fast. Your primary goal is to get material installed. Now let me ask you a question. What does waiting on a scissor lift to charge so you can continue your work have to do with installing material? Nothing. 
What does a crew waiting on missing material to arrive have to do with installing material? Nothing. What does two journeymen waiting on a specialty tool to arrive on site have to do with installing material? That's right. Nothing. What does your lead electrician bitching to the carpenter about his ex-wife have to do with installing material? Not a darn thing. Here's my point. You need to do everything you can to pave the way for your crew so that when they show up at their assigned work area, they have no obstacles to prevent them from installing material. That means you need to have all of the material, tools, equipment, and manpower on site and in their work area before they're ready to install it. You need to understand the contract documents and have answers for every gray area before they turn their first screw. You need the plumber and tin knocker out of the way. You need to make sure the general contractor has the work you need in place and their material, tools, equipment, and trash out of your way before your crews move in. That's what I mean about serving your crew. You need to make it as easy as possible for them to get in there and install material all day long. The better you do this, the more profitable your project will be. You need to make installing material your number one goal, and you need to eliminate everything you possibly can that might keep that from happening. The better you are at this, the more efficient your job site will be. I once had a foreman working for me that always had the right things in place at the right time, but he always waited until the last minute to make it happen. It drove me nuts. I always gave him the heads up on things several weeks in advance, and he waited right up to the last possible minute to execute. One day I asked him what the date was. He quickly told me, the 7th of December. I quickly responded, wrong. He looked at me a little confused and said, look, it's right here on my phone, December 7th. I said, no, Ron, it's the 21st of December. If you're not looking two weeks ahead of yourself, you're living in the past. You need your material on site two weeks before you need it. If you bring it in here at the last minute, you're flying by the seat of your pants and that doesn't work for me. What if General Motors had a crew punch in but no material to build any cars? Sounds ridiculous, right? A job site's no different. Materials need to be on site two weeks in advance. Tools and equipment are a different subject but should be on the radar two weeks in advance. You need to ask yourself two questions at the end of each day. Do I have all the material on site today that I'm going to need two weeks from now? And Will I have the tools, equipment, and manpower on site in time to install it? You need to walk through every task. When you assign a task to a worker, you should walk them through the task and tell them exactly how you want it completed. Leave a little room for discussion. There are often a hundred different ways to complete each task and 80 of them will be acceptable. If the worker has a suggestion and it won't disrupt the overall result you're trying to achieve, or if it's just flat out a better way, let them do it their way and thank them for the suggestion. Everybody likes to make a contribution, and workers feel good at the end of the day when they help create good solutions. Unless it's critically important to the outcome, be flexible and encourage participation. This will make work more enjoyable for them without affecting your outcome. Happy workers truly are productive workers. As time goes on, you will both get comfortable with each other's methods, and your workers will learn how to flavor their work to match your preference. Let the employee get satisfaction from their work. It is really important to understand that people like to succeed. 
They like to win and they like to showcase their skills. This is what makes their job enjoyable for them. When you give them the ability to play a role in how they build things, they appreciate it and start to enjoy working for you. That is why it's important to let them flavor the task as much as possible with their own methods and ideas. This promotes ownership of the task. Let them know that as long as they can perform the task efficiently and professionally, then you'll let them have more freedom to suggest their methods. However, if they don't succeed, you'll have to select the methods in the future. This will challenge them to make suggestions wisely and make every effort to give you results that impress. At the end of the day, they will go home fulfilled and satisfied that they created something special on their own, and they'll look forward to returning tomorrow and doing it again. Instead of just a job, their work will become an exciting event that they look forward to each day. Happy workers truly are productive workers. Always keep this in mind. After you go through the task and you've both agreed exactly how it is to be accomplished, always have the worker repeat the task back to you. When people listen, their minds are constantly thinking ahead of your speech. By the time you get the word conduit out, they've already decided how many bins it will have, what type of supports they're going to use, and how many beers they're going to drink after work to celebrate. If you make them repeat it back, they will tell you exactly what they're going to do to screw it up. As clear as you are in your instruction, you will be amazed how different their interpretation of your instruction is. Make them repeat it until they get it right. This one suggestion will save you thousands of dollars in rework. And once they learn that you're going to make them repeat the task back to you, on future tasks, they'll start paying closer attention in order to get through the process quicker. Now, rewind the video player and listen to that again. This is that invaluable. If you rush through your direction and don't make them repeat it back until they get it right, you're going to end up with five crews who are installing material that will have to be reworked. You only get paid one time to install material. When the estimator compiles the estimate, they do not say to themselves, well, this is a complicated task, so I'm going to price it to be installed twice. They only allow for it to be installed one time. It is your responsibility to make sure that happens. If you have to take it out and install it twice, you're losing money. If you lose money, you're not going to be a foreman very long. So always make them repeat the task back to you. If the worker you're delegating task to is new to your crew, after assigning the task, you need to check on them frequently. You want to make sure they are following the plan, that their workmanship is up to par, and that they're meeting your production goals. If things are going well, make sure you tell them so. If things are not going well, be gentle in your criticism and be encouraging. Everyone's a little nervous and stressed when they begin working for someone new. This will help them settle down and the feedback will get them used to the level and style of workmanship you're looking for. Once they have completed several tasks for you, they should get a feel for what you want and start meeting your needs consistently. Once they reach that level, get the hell out of their way and let them do their job. Realize that not every task is going to be completed in just exactly the manner you see it in your mind. Insist that they contact you before they change anything in the agreed plan, but be prepared to see things altered just a bit. As long as the overall goal is achieved, the work looks good, and they met their time allowance, accept it and move on. This will help keep you both sane. 
I once knew a young family who had their first child, a boy. These two parents had every detail of this young child's life mapped out for him. They told him what to eat, when to sleep, how to walk, what toys to play with, and how to dress. There wasn't any part of his day or his life that they did not dictate to him. One day, the kid quit pooping. They'd put him on the toilet and demand that he do his duty and the kid would just sit there. He wouldn't let it go. Eventually, they took him to a doctor. The doctor gave him a clean bill of health, so they took him to a psychologist, told him of the issue, and asked for his help. After some discovery, the psychologist told them that the reason the kid wouldn't poop was because it was the only thing he had control over. Don't be this type of foreman. Let people think a little. Let them have a little say about how they install things. I promise that they'll be much happier and much more productive. Although you're the expert, there will be times when you encounter an issue that you might struggle deciding on the best solution for. Whenever I come up against a problem like this, I like to assemble the whole crew right down to the greenest apprentice. I'll explain the issue and ask for opinions on the best solution. This is called brainstorming. Every worker on your crew has a lifetime of different experiences, and there's a wealth of knowledge there. You'll be surprised at the responses you get. A lot will be garbage, but one idea will strike you. You may not like it as it was presented, but you'll tweak it just a little bit and spit it back out and see what the others think. Then someone else will add to it, and someone else will change it just a little. And pretty soon, you'll have a solution that you're excited about. Don't overlook this option. Don't be too proud to employ this valuable tactic. It has helped me out of more than one sticky situation. One time I was building a new chemical process at a petrochemical plant in Kansas. The owner, a chemist, liked to go into his lab and create new chemical compounds. Then he'd bring me in to look at all his little beakers and Bunsen burners and say, see how I'm heating this up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit? and stirring it gently like this until that gas starts to come off the top and pushes through this little copper coil line I have running through this ice to condense it down and then it mixes it with this other chemical over here for 35 minutes but I have to keep it cool because there's a reaction and it heats up and creates pressure and if it gets out of control it'll crack the beaker and so on. Then he'd tell me, okay, now I want to make 2,500 gallons of it at a time. He'd build a new building, order a bunch of equipment, and I would recreate his little experiment for him on a much larger scale. So one day I was putting the finishing touches on one of these experiments. This is an exact picture of it right here. For this process, he chose to use an oil boiler because he needed temperatures in the 500 to 550 range, and he didn't like steam. With steam came pressure, and pressure scared the hell out of him. So I had this system that included two chemical reactors and about three heat exchangers all piped together. I had added the oil to the boiler, essentially vegetable oil, and I started circulating it through the system for the first time testing valve sequences. My lead electrician named Royal was working with me, and as it started to circulate, we followed the lines to make sure there weren't any leaks. We followed it from the boiler to the first reactor to the second reactor, out to the heat exchanger at the cooling pond, into the heat exchanger in the boiler room, back out to the first reactor, over to the second. Oh my God! Shut it down! Quick! Shut it down! Apparently, 
there was a port on the second reactor that we weren't aware of that hadn't been sealed off. And we had about 55 gallons of vegetable oil on the ground. Do you have any idea what 55 gallons of vegetable oil looks like on the ground? We surrounded it with pigs lickety split while it was still draining. I didn't feel like that old chemist would fire me for this incident, but he was an ass chewer, and I knew he'd chew my ass up one side and down the other if he found out. I stood there frantically trying to figure out the best way to clean up 55 gallons of vegetable oil fast and I was coming up empty so I just blurted out Royal I don't know if you have any ideas on how to clean this up fast but if you do I'd sure like to hear them right now Royal almost on cue tossed out a question wet and dry vacuum I said get it do you know we had that oil sucked up in no time and transferred to a 55-gallon drum? We filtered it as we poured it back into the drum and had the whole thing cleaned up before that old chemist made his rounds to check on us. He never had a clue. Don't be afraid to ask for suggestions. You never know what you might hear. From time to time, you'll have to reprimand someone for some type of action, whether it's poor workmanship, excessive tardiness, or creating disharmony. You may not enjoy this type of confrontation, but you need to deal with it anyway. Don't let it build up. If it builds and builds, you're likely to ultimately explode and be harsher than necessary. Remember, you're not criticizing the person, you're criticizing the behavior. The best way to do this is to feed them a shit sandwich. I don't know where I learned this, but it works really well. You start by throwing down a nice, thick slice of sweet bread. Joe, you know you're one of my best workers. You and I have been working together for a long time, and you've bailed me out more times than I can remember. That gets their guard down and prepares them for what's coming next. Then you spread a nice thick layer of shit. But you have really been screwing up lately. You've been showing up late several times a week and last week you ran a two inch feeder conduit to the wrong room. It took a crew half a day to get that straightened out. Then before their emotions get out of control, you cap it with another nice, thick slice of sweet bread. I really need your head in the game, Joe. You're one of my best guys on my crew, and I'm not going to get this done on time without your help. Please, pull it together so we don't have to have any more of these conversations. You're much better than that. Make sure you make good eye contact so they know you're sincere. You just held a mirror up in front of that person and showed him how talented he is. Shamed him because he's not performing up to his own level and gave him the opportunity to get back in the groove and operate at the level he's capable of. Rarely does anyone ever get argumentative with me when I use this method. They don't feel like you're criticizing them because you're complimenting them and telling them how valuable they are. They normally admit their shortcoming, apologize, and straighten up. If you have to escalate the issue even to the point of firing, they normally understand that you like them and that it was their own actions that led to their termination. Everyone needs to know that they're appreciated. Take the time to thank individuals for their good work. When someone really comes through for you, make sure you acknowledge the extra effort and thank them for it right away. Periodically, get the whole crew together at the end of the day. Tell them that you really appreciate them as a crew. Tell them that they're doing a great job. Shake every one of their hands and thank them individually before you let them leave. Workers like to know that they're valued and appreciated. Yes, they get paid for their work, but many times recognition and appreciation are far more valuable to them than money. Don't forget that. 
Maybe once a week I like to have my crew line up single file at the end of the day. The first time is always a little awkward because they don't know what you're going to do and they feel like a kindergarten class. But after the first time, they love it. I go to the head of the line and shake the first worker's hand and tell them, thank you for your hard work. I really appreciate your efforts and there's no way I could complete this job without you. Thank you very much. Then I go to the next worker and the next and so on. I've had grown men stagger away in a daze because no one has ever shaken their hand and personally thanked them for their good work. That's a damn shame because many times being appreciated is worth much more than a paycheck. Remember this, everybody likes to be recognized for their contribution and it's too rare of occasion when it actually happens. Recognize people, individually and as a group. If you'll do this one thing regularly, you'll have workers requesting to work on your projects, and they'll be more productive. Okay, this is the backbone of your crew management system. Learn it and practice it. You can even start implementing it as a lead electrician or as a crew member. In a short amount of time, it will become habit. We're going to tie this in and expand on it when we get to the scheduling portion of the course. It will be the glue that holds your schedule together, so it's really important that it becomes second nature to you. Commit these practices to memory. Make them habit.